ready to we're good to go great thanks mark um yeah uh, really happy to present this um, next course in our um, all electric case studies uh, presentation uh, presented by ed dean and based on the books that we worked with ed to author that uh, will provide links for you to download for the full case studies that will uh, give you information on the ones that are covered in the course, as well as uh, several additional that uh, we don't have time to cover in the material as well. Uh, but uh, very happy to partner with the AIA LA uh, to present this educational content. We'll have two more courses uh, in uh, October and November. Uh, we do, do some deeper dive onto some uh, energy code topics in our next session. So keep an eye out for those. Uh, the uh, sign up pages are live on the AI website. So uh, be sure to check those out and uh, sign up for those as well. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'd love to uh, kick it over to Ed Dean, who is um, our uh, author and presenter from Burnham and Dean, has uh, authored uh, a series of seven case studies going back to the inception of the net zero case studies books and is a long time uh, uh, sustainability champion uh, designing projects and managing projects for several large firms throughout California over the course of his long career and is also a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. Um, a little reminder that today's session will be recorded and that the recording will be available for later viewing as well and you'll be getting your certificates uh, of attendance uh, as a follow-up to the course today. So without further ado, I'd like to kick it over to Ed to give today's presentation. Okay, thanks, uh, Dave. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, sharing the uh, window in just a minute. I'll uh, start the slideshow. Okay. They're all set up. Um, uh, thanks and welcome everyone uh, to this uh, uh, one hour presentation of three case studies. Um, um, this is uh, uh, three case studies of multifamily buildings. And it turns out they're uh, what are known as uh, uh, affordable housing projects. Um, uh, there's a book, the last book that I came out um, is you see there in the upper right hand corner um, is a book with five case studies. Uh, the, the three affordable case studies appear in the book. The other two are market rate multifamily uh, projects. Um, and uh, uh, it's available um, for download. I'll show you in just a second where um, it's based on that book, and that you see that now in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, but the seventh book of the, the series Dave referred to. And at the very top of the slide is the uh, website where you can download any of these books uh, free of charge in PDF form, and also have a link to a, a flip book um, uh, where you can just read it online. You don't have to down, uh, download anything. Um, and uh, the third option is to... Uh, if you want a soft cover book, they're printed quite nicely by Amazon uh, on their website. So you just enter one of the titles, Designing for Zero Carbon, for example, and you'll be you'll find all seven there linked together as a series. Um, so um, let's plunge into the case studies. Um, and uh, this is the, the contents of today's um, presentation. Um, there's going to be a little introduction to this talk about affordable housing and what that means. And then we'll plunge into the three case studies. Um, there are two new projects, um, one in San Diego and one up in San Francisco, oh. which is almost a uh, high rise project. And th there is one renovation project in, in Central Valley to look at. They're, they're all quite interesting, which is why they're in the book. Um, and so uh, let me uh, talk about aff affordable housing. I, I actually had to look this up and it is defined uh, to some degree in, in the book. Um, it's um, affordable housing is basically uh, uh, defines a rent that is affordable for a social group 
uh, as defined by the um, area so, median you income. Want to go through this list, Mickey, because I know that you had some names you wanted to put forward, and then we can. The second topic that I feel I. I oh, uh, sorry. Somebody doesn't yeah. have audio muted. Uh, the conversation is coming through. Um, I thought it was a live question. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, affordable housing is defined as the uh, percentage of the area median income, the AMI. Uh, those of you who do uh, affordable housing know exactly exactly what this is. Uh, and you can read more detail about this um, in the book. The Keith element is in the table in the bottom. Um, it, it defines what uh, low income and very low income and so, so on, low income groups. Um, sorry, click on the trigger finger. Um, um, so a low income housing is 50 to 80 percent. Um, the rent is 50 to 80, sorry, the income is 50 to 80 percent of the area median income. Median, median means exactly in the middle. So all they somehow average all the uh, income levels of a county, find the median value, and then if you're making 50 to 80 percent of that income, household income, you're considered low income. And so affordable housing is housing which has defined uh, as um, a maximum rent, a rent that it can be afforded by these uh, income growths. Anyway, I, I'm spending too much time in this. Uh, know that the details um, are uh, contained in the book. You can look it up further. Um, this book, uh, the three, three um, affordable housing projects um, are um, all low income, uh, but they are in addition a um, another social group criteria. The, the first one is uh, low income seniors. Um, that's the one in San Diego. Uh, low, low income farm workers, of course, in Central Valley. And then uh, they, it can be low uh, income residents, in this case, in San Francisco, or Pacific District. And they include also uh, in this uh, a segment of the housing in, in San Francisco project, but um, youth um, formerly um, um, uh, 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 youth at risk. Um, so th this is from the forward of the book. If you get the book, you'll see this diagram. It's kind of interesting. And I thought I'd include it uh, in the introduction to this talk, uh, which is a summary of all the statistics of um, low-income people in the Cal state of California. Actually, a third of the population is considered in that definition of a low-income. A third of the population is either low-income or less. Uh, and interestingly, 42% of them, of all that group, live in multifamily housing. So it's multifamily housing, affordable multifamily housing is uh, a major topic, a major um, uh, issue about in, in California for housing. Um, we find this uh, in the forward to the book if you uh, download it. Um, and so now uh, we want to uh, look at the three projects. Each one of them is structured. I'm gonna present it where the, um, you're going to get a little bit of project background so you understand what what it's all about the program and so on the the key do design strategies for zero carbon right energy efficiency that is after all what uh, we're all about Are you guys in the zoom meeting here no no yeah. okay um no, so noel please. would you please mute yourself we can hear you <laughs> thanks thanks dave uh and then uh re renewable energy sources all these Projects uh, are now required to have certain amount of renewable, and it plays into the whole design strategy. Uh, we want to do a little bit of energy, uh, the carbon analysis, uh, modeling of the uh, performance of the buildings uh, bef during design. Also, an embodied carbon analysis is getting to be more imp more important in uh, part of the design phase. So we want to address that. When when was done for the third project we're going to look at. And it's very informative. And the uh, last thing is uh, lessons learned from uh, these projects. Um, and uh, there's always something to be learned before they do the next one. So here we go. Um, the first project is in San Diego. You can see it's a low rise uh, building. Um, it's the low income seniors um, that uh, is the uh, clientele. Uh, the uh, the client for the architect uh, team was 
uh, this uh, Wakeland Housing, um, a nonprofit who builds affordable housing uh, throughout California. Um, the uh, uh, the reason they 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 settled on the the particular group of uh, forming the homeless seniors was partly uh, being able to build it in this particular suburban neighborhood of San, uh, San Diego. The neighborhood didn't uh, make a fuss about this particular group, so they went ahead and um, designed it for them. Uh, also, um, when they were designing it, they realized indoor air quality was going to be an issue for this group, and that actually was one of the factors in making the decision to build an all electric building uh, so they would be uh, really good air quality. Um, the architects, I'm going to make, make sure I mention the architect and engineer on each project, was uh, BNIM of San Diego, San Diego office, and Green MEP of Newport Beach. Uh, the years were um, 2018, 2019 was the design period. Uh, construction was underway in 2020. 2021 and uh, occupancy was in the fall of 2021. There, there are studio apartments for, for, all, for each of the seniors and uh, for the manager, on-site manager. Uh, so it's going to be identical units you'll see uh, coming up. Here is the site plan. Uh, it was founded originally, you can see in the upper left, uh, it was a, a suburban office building uh, it's bounded on, by, on two sides by, very, two, uh, by a large uh, suburban shopping center. And um, you can see all the parking that was required for the, for the existing building on the site. And on the right is um, the uh, project under construction. There's much less parking. They got an exception uh, to a parking requirement. And this parking was only uh, limited to staff and visitors. So they got to build more building as a result of that. Uh, so that was good. Um, here is uh, the site plan. Um, all the units are the same uh, in the site plan. It's number seven. All the each individual studio apartment, and this is the ground floor plan. You can see the administration and uh, medical uh, uh, facilities, um, uh, which is needed for this uh, group, is uh, near the entry to the project. The labeled nine. And there's a multi-use, uh, multi-purpose space in uh, number six, and the limited parking there to the um, uh, west. <clears throat> um, and this is a view uh, of what it housing looks like from various locations. There's the multi-purpose room in the right-hand slide, glassed in. You can see where it is. Um, this section kind of shows uh, more. Um, now the building envelope, let's march through the energy features, energy conserving energy use features of the building. Building envelope comes first. Um, it, it's a actually a, a uh, it just meets California Title 24. So it's um, the usual details that you might have in any project. Uh, the windows are double glazed. So all of this is cost-based. There's nothing exceptional beyond the code. And that's primary, primarily for cost reasons, for first cost reasons. It's always the major factor in, in projects like this. Uh, notice how they uh, utilize the sawtooth design of the units uh, to get a full height window at, at one position, which really daylights the space, makes it very nice. Um, and this is the HVAC system. They, they um, since you're, since there's no gas, it's uh, you're gonna use a heat pump in one way or another. This one has a heat pump for each unit uh, and the condenser part is located on the roof and then uh, refrigerant piping comes down to the, the uh, fan call unit. And since it's a studio, it makes it very simple for the fan call unit to uh, heat or cool the space. And the, the, the main feature here is that, um, the main attribute is they didn't have to uh, maximize the floor to ceiling height because they didn't have to bring ducts into the units or anything like that. And um, by compressing, um, maximizing the floor to ceiling height, but still it, it kept the floor to floor height uh, at a minimum, it saved for its cost again. So that was good. They got energy efficiency and cost savings uh, out of this. Um, and uh, the um, hot water is a central system. That's the case uh, true of all of these projects. It's more efficient to have a central system for, 
of water heating. What's, what's peculiar about this, you can see um, this project was done earlier than the other two. So at this time, um, solar thermal systems were required as a preheat to uh, hot water systems. You can see it in the diagram here on the left. Um, and the heat pump is part of the uh, heating system. It's uh, the red arrow is pointing to the uh, two heat pump units. They put in two, one for backup for the other one. Um, and they're, they're, they're located on the edge of the site. They're somewhat noisy. So that, I think that's the reason they put them out on the edge. Um, but the, the significant fact here is in 2020, uh, the regulation about requiring a solar thermal system was done away with. They no longer required to have them as, as part of the system because the, the fact is they preheat the water, which makes the heat pump less efficient. And they discovered this after a couple of years uh, of use um, and uh, they, they're no longer required. So you won't have to do this if you get, if you get a project like this. Um, you can see what happened to, on the roof of the building, the limited roof area built, uh, available. Uh, initially, they it took up uh, one entire uh, roof just for the solar thermal system. And the um, even the final design took up half of that area, um, uh, all of which could have been used for um, solar PV uh, panels. Um, and this is the view uh, as built. You can see all the uh, solar PV panels over the rest of the roof and the in the upper left-hand corner, uh, the, the solar thermal panels are, are uh, you can see it right there. Um, and you can read about the details of all these systems in the book. Um, and oh, I wanted to mention they, they are bifacial solar panels. If you don't know what that is, you should definitely, they, they should, you should definitely uh, check that out because uh, bifacial panels are, uh, good they collect light from the backside so you have a light colored roof which saves for on uh in uh heat gain uh it also reflects light and uh, can hit the panels from the backside and you get more collect more energy that way uh and they uh, the architects did that on on this project uh they modeled uh, the energy you use using ordinary um uh, uh energy uh, pro uh program um, and they, the measured EUI uh, from the actual use uh, was uh, very close to what was modeled. So this is a good example of something following um, closely what was modeled. Um, and here is the curve for um, uh, the actual performance of the solar. There's not much roof area. So the solar PV uh, provides roughly 30% of the building energy use. Uh, in this one year uh, of, of uh, records. Uh, so if you're using the roof in a multifamily building and you get a third of the energy offset by PV, um, that's kind of typical. Um, and um, the client was very happy with uh, their all electric design. It, it saved, it actually saved money, first cost wise and um, obviously an operating maintenance cost as time went on. Um, they did not plan for batteries. I always comment on this because this is uh, something you, you should think about in your project, multifamily project, uh, is the installation of batteries, both for resilience and also for ev evening, evening out the uh, electric uh, load. So that, the, <clears throat> for example, when if you get charged more for electricity from the utility in the evening hours, if you can store your energy collected in the solar uh, during the day and use that at night, you're going to save uh, money. Um, so batteries pay back that way too. Um, and they they did put in uh, ele electric vehicle charging infrastructure, the the pipes and the conduit in the ground for the uh, visitor staff parking, so they can install EVs. As you, as everybody knows, uh, we're going to have a massive, uh, uh, we're having it right now, uh, uh, change of the, the car um, uh, automobile makeup in California is gonna switch from gasoline to electric in the next 10 years is gonna grow quite significantly. And uh, EV charging is gonna be a factor in any design. So they, they did put the infrastructure in, in uh, 2020. 
so that was good. Um, and they didn't do uh, the em embodied carbon analysis. In 2018, it was not uh, advanced enough, <clears throat> the analysis techniques. Um, it's, it, that changed a year or two later, and you'll see the, uh, at the, in the third case study uh, what when somebody did it for, for a project, what, what that turned out to do. Um, so that wraps up the first case study. As I say, the details are in um, the book and, and also references you can pursue online for more discussion of a particular topic. Um, so again, encourage you to download the PDF free of charge. Um, any questions uh, at this point, Dave? That I didn't. I didn't see any in the chat. Um, uh, if anyone wants to briefly unmute themselves and ask a question, they'd be welcome to at this point. There is a reminder, though, in the chat to um, be sure that your Zoom handle matches either your registration name or email. Otherwise, uh, we may not know that you actually attended, in which case you wouldn't get credit. So just be sure that you update that if uh, you don't have that matching. And we'll give a moment for anyone to kind of speak up to answer or to ask a question. Otherwise, Ed will continue in a moment here. All right. You can also raise your hand, but I don't see any hands raised. Okay. All right. I think you can proceed on. Thanks, Ed. All right. So now we come to the uh, um, uh, affordable housing project in the Central Valley. This is uh, Rich Grove, California, which is uh, due east of Delano. Um, so it's right in the heart of the Central Valley. Um, uh, and uh, it's a housing project that was built in 1996 for uh, field, uh, field workers. And um, it, it became the subject of uh, the, uh, upgrade, the possible upgrade. Uh, so you see the uh, Google map view of uh, the thing from satellite from outer space. Um, this is a, 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 this was a <clears throat> actually a combination project. So the, these are low income farm workers as defined by uh, low income affordability. The client was um, uh, named Self Help Enterprises. They do a lot of um, building and managing housing uh, in uh, communities in the Central Valley. Um, the thing about this project, which made, which made it really interesting and uh, informative, is that it was kind of two projects. One was renovation of buildings that were about 20 years old, 25 years old. Um, they, there was very simple buildings, four walls and a gable roof. Um, but they, in, in a way, because of that uh, simplicity of structure, um, it became the subject of a research study where people looked at the idea of um, employing um, uh, industrialized uh, panels uh, to refurbish the units and uh, from retrofit uh, from the outside. And um, it's kind of a demonstration project of these retrofit strategies uh, uh, with new techniques and new technological advances in, in building technologies. Um, so we're gonna I'll talk about both of them. You'll see that there's both the both a simple um, a typical renovation, and there is this uh, 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 testing of new methods uh, uh, done on two parts of the project. Um, so uh, there are 49 units, uh, apartment units, and uh, a bunch of buildings. And I'll show you again on the website, uh, the location of visiting the map, where it's located. You can see the farmland to the um, east and to the north of the site. Uh, a school is nearby, you can see that, and some of the industrial farm, farm working uh, warehouses on the left side. Um, this is, uh, as I say, was built in 1996, and there are one and two story buildings. And there's one community building also in the project. Um, and uh, here's another um, Google Earth view. This is uh, before the retrofit. So you see parking areas and civil housing and some, something called the community building is identified, but also of two buildings, 615 and 619, right there in the middle. Those were the subject of this uh, experimental, um, they called it rapid deployment. Uh, is there a way of applying industrialized building technologies to these buildings and let the 
uh, occupants stay in the building while this is happening. They don't require them to move on, move out, or disrupt their lives while the work is being done to the building. Uh, that was the idea behind uh, looking at this. Um, they took as a model something that was being done in Europe uh, on very simple public housing projects. And uh, you'll see it in just a moment. Uh, so phase one uh, actually was um, a separate from this renovation part of the project. Um, phase one was installation of car canopies where you see cars in this uh, photograph. Uh, they put canopies over a, a number of these parking areas in a solar, solar PV system and got it all operating before they started the renovation mark. Then phase two of the project, which occurred in 2021 and 2022, um, phase two was a rapid deployment uh, research project on building 615 and 619. And at, simultaneously was phase three, uh, the whole building energy efficiency re retrofit of the um, 41 remaining apartments. Uh, Building 615 uh, and 619 each had four units in it. And you'll see the plans in just a minute. Um, and uh, so that was the structure of the project. You'll we'll see a little detail now. Here, here is the so-called rapid deployment research study, the two buildings that um, they, they were gonna try this industrialized uh, methods uh, on. You can see that there are four units, you can tell from the floor plans there are four separate units. One of them is on the second story in each case, and they're quite large. Uh, and so there, there, there were families in there. Yep, I think I went too fast. Okay, hang on, patience. Okay, so this shows a picture of what they did. Um, they, they were applying a, um, uh, a, a roof panel systems, uh, metal roof panel systems, um, insulated panels, a, a little bit like if you've heard of SIPs, a little bit like SIPs are to walls, these are to roofs. Um, and by uh, designing them and fitting them on the roof, they could quickly retrofit. They didn't, didn't have to go inside the buildings to retrofit or insulate and so on, which would be very disruptive to the occupant. This they could do all from the outside. It'd be kind of noisy, but <laughs> it can be done. Um, and would be rapidly deployable over these simple kind of structures. Um, so um, um, the the uh, other buildings, the the two non um, research studies, uh, the, the two research studies uh, got this uh, uh, industrialized system. The other 40, uh, 41 units uh, in the, their buildings got ordinary uh, attic insulation, blow-in attic insulation. Um, so uh, the building envelope, they, they figured out pretty quickly, as long as tenants were inside the building and, and they had to live their lives and not be disrupted by the work, they couldn't do uh, any retrofit to the existing walls. And it was also very, some, you know, some of it dipped out, like in the photograph, a dip in and dip out of the planes of the walls. And so uh, the fact that they were occupied, they, they couldn't do anything with the envelope. They did manage to replace the glass in the windows uh, with double glazed units, uh, um, and they got new uh, windows out of it, out of it. But the only thing they did to the walls was paint it with elastomeric paint to seal it up as best they could. Um, and so that, um, sorry, I'm got Har Har mouse in the wrong place there. Hang on, okay. So um, air tightness was something they thought would improve the uh, energy performance of these buildings. Um, and by, uh, by sealing off at the attic ceiling interface and then um, uh, having no air leak into the attic and out, it was an open air attic. And so uh, be, being ventilated, it was a natural draw for air out of the units uh, through the attic and out. They wanted to seal off the attic and um, they they did that by um, ordinary methods in most of the, most of the buildings. But they took three buildings and tested them uh, using. Um, I'll just say this, uh, uh, and then refer you to the uh, book, and where this is discussed in much more detail. If you want to learn more about it, the, um, the, uh, something called aerosol sealing. The, there was a, a, a way with, of sealing this. That, that's a method they use with sealing ducts. 
and um, you can only use air aerosol sealing um, by letting the air carry this uh, stuff to the place where the air might leak out and it kind of adheres to those locations. I won't go into any more detail, but uh, maybe that will intrigue you enough to, to look at the, uh, the description in the book and uh, see what it is. Uh, otherwise, uh, standard foam ceiling was used. If you look at the air um, blower door tests that were done on the uh, buildings, see before the attic ceiling, they, there were eight air changes per hour at 50 uh, uh, air changes uh, per hour um, at 50 pounds pressure. And uh, when you use standard foam ceiling, it makes a little bit of improvement, but it really improved a lot when they used the aerosol ceiling method. And so that's a, that's a new technique. Uh, if you're interested in learning more about it, um, check out the, the uh, book. Um, heating and cooling, uh, they had gas, uh, gas furnaces that were literally mounted on the roof. So it's kind of ugly looking um, big gas units and, air, and cooling packages, both of them mounted on a platform on the roof in 1996. And they got rid of those and uh, installed these heat pumps and uh, they're obviously working much better. In uh, building 619, which is one of the experimental buildings, they decided to try um, energy recovery ventilator ERV. And some of you may, may be using uh, that in uh, some of the airtight buildings you're, you're designing. Uh, but they tried it here in the farm workers uh, building and um, uh, determined whether it was practical and cost effective or not. Um, Domestic hot water, um, the, uh, they have uh, all the gas fired um, water heaters were replaced by these heat pumps. Some of you may be, may be doing this in your own house, replacing your gas fired water heater with the heat pump water heater. They, they, have, to go in a, they have to go in an outside closet um, because they're heating the water and uh, taking the uh, uh, air, as the outflowing air is uh, cooler, so it's like air conditioning. Uh, and if you're heating a house, you don't wanna have this thing in the house. So anyway, exterior closet is a place to put them. Um, <clears throat> and this is a summary of everything that was done to the, uh, uh, all the uh, things in the air, uh, farm workers housing. They, uh, they actually did not replace the um, electric ranges that they had in the units because they replacing them with, with induction stoves um, would have cost too much money. Uh, and for, again, first costs um, became a determinant. So they did not replace the electric ranges and the, the, the existing electric ranges were just kept. And they, they, everybody was used to using them. So that was just fine. And they, they did replace the uh, kitchen and bathroom exhaust fans with something uh, with lower power because Typically, the, the exhaust fans were uh, are oversized um, and don't need to be as uh, voluminous as they are, um, and so they replace them, and they they play, replace them with fans that have a very low uh, operation. They're always operating at a very low speed, and then if you turn them on, they rev up, but they they're not like the uh, super power fans that the that they uh, traditionally installed. Um, so uh, this is the, the phase one project uh, covering the, some of the parking areas with uh, canopies and PV panels. This was the PV insulation for the whole project. Um, this was installed by uh, Sunrun. Uh, they did it as a third party PPA. So they maintain the solar panels and under a power purchase agreement or PPA, um, they receive all the tax credits, and um, uh, but and they they basically they sell a solar uh, credit back to the uh, individual tenants who have their separate bills with uh, Southern California Edison. Um, and uh, yes, so there was a energy modeling was done for building six nineteen. And um, this is the way it looked, um, heating, cooling. Um, they, they were using something like 49, uh, an EUI of 49 or 50. Uh, and the uh, approved, the change in the EUI went from 50 <clears throat> to 18. 
that was uh, if that was the uh, modeling prediction. Uh, so that's quite an improvement. Um, they were un un they were unable to collect all the data at the time of the report. Uh, so I don't know exactly what what the measured UI uh, is for this building, but the model says that they you know cut it down by uh, to forty percent of what it used to be. Uh, they did um, have a meter uh, measuring um, all the apartments, uh, including the ones that were part of the research project. Um, and they measured, uh, they modeled all the apartments as one, and they measured the energy used by all the apartments. And the, um, there was a measurement of the amount of solar produced. And you see the actual result on the right. Um, the, uh, uh, the architects... Did I mention who they are? I think I forgot. <laughs> Bear with me. Uh, it, it was David Baker, uh, architects uh, in San Francisco, um, Associate, AEA, Association for Energy. Um, um, sorry, I don't remember the last uh, a acronym. Um, and, um, and a couple of others. Uh, there was a uh, building science consultant and so on. Anyway, the... Um, the uh, AEA people uh, say, uh, be sure to point out that they were still doing the retrofit in uh, early 2022, first five or six months, it was still doing the retrofit. That's one of the reasons that the use is higher than that model. Um, but it, the high use continued uh, later on. I think that's a little bit of user education that has to come into play there. Um, here is uh, that, that comparative curve, the energy use of all apartments, um, and below is the amount of energy uh, produced um, by the solar PV system. Um, I, by the way, the energy used by all apartments uh, is the energy used before solar credits are applied. So that's the actual use of the building. Um, and the uh, PV system uh, was modeled, the dash line represents a model of the energy uh, solar energy um, provided by the system that was uh, created by uh, the program of PV Watts. Um, and the actual solar energy provided is uh, the solid curve below it. And the reason the difference is, I think I think this is interesting, it's the only reason I'm belaboring the point. Um, the, the, um, it, it produced less because of the dust blowing from nearby fields. Uh, uh, the, the, they're plowing the field and, and dust fills the air and the, the, you have to maintain more than more than the average uh, requirement to clean keep the PV panels clean, um, and but dust is all around everywhere. So uh, that is the reason for the uh, slight underperformance of the PV panels. So uh, for this, oops, yeah, for this project, um, they did do an all electric retrofit. Uh, they cut the use way down. Um, the uh, thing about the um, the fact that they were doing the research study it re required extra coordination with all the all the um, uh, subcontractors, and so the the self up enterprises, the client, ended up doing a lot of general contractor type work, coordinating when uh, sub sub uh, contractors could get on the units and so on and so forth. Uh, that was one thing, um, and um, <clears throat> they are now evaluating whether things like the rapid deployment of roof panels could quickly uh, be a way to retrofit civil buildings like this up and down the state. Uh, that report is gonna come out very shortly. And I guess I'm gonna ask if there are any uh, more questions before we launch the final case study. Uh, Mark, the, are you monitoring any questions? Yes, I, I'm here. I don't see any questions right now, other than uh, someone would be uh, would like uh, the link to the PDF to the book. Uh, but I can get that from you after and uh, send it out with my thank you email. Okay, do that. But it'll also come up at, on the last slide. Okay. So, so no worries. Thank you. Other than that, no other questions. So you, I guess we can continue. If anyone has any okay. questions throughout the rest of the uh, seminar, please put them in the chat and we'll get to them. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the third case study is a very urban um, affordable housing project, uh, multifamily project. And you can see the San Francisco skyline in the distance there. 
Um, uh, this is uh, a good example of a lot of different reasons. Um, um, what happened here, th this is in the Mission District of San Francisco. Any of you who know San Francisco know that uh, that part of San Francisco um, received an influx of uh, tech workers who were working for uh, you know, Google and uh, Facebook and so forth, uh, who have downtown office, Twitter, you know, a lot of offices in downtown San Francisco. And so they moved into the Mission District. And they, so the influx of tech workers, um, the, the people who traditionally lived in the Mission were working class and Latino neighborhoods. Um, they, they, uh, there was a kind of alarm of this uh, gentrification of the historically, um, uh, historic Mission District. And so uh, neighborhood groups nonprofit neighborhood groups were formed to work on behalf of those residents and to create housing that they could afford and get out of the uh, inflation caused by the gentrification nearby. Um, so one of the uh, not neighborhood groups is called Mission Economic Development Agency. Um, and they um, basically um, started to work on the city and get um, uh, a real estate activity going for make to make whole affordable housing projects for, for this part of the city, um, and the uh, mayor's city of uh, HCD or Housing Community Development, they issued a competitive RFP in, in 2015 for just this kind of project uh, on a Mission District site, um, and um, in order to be the client, a developer, uh, M M E D A. Uh, joined with Chinatown Community Development Center uh, because they had experience building projects. So they, they had the financial um, uh, portfolio uh, and that qualified uh, the team to submit. That's how complicated th this kind of stuff can get. Um, so they submitted and uh, they successfully, uh, they won the project. And, and the design team they submitted with was uh, Methune at San Francisco office as, inter, as architect and integral group now in Troba uh, as the MEP engineer. And they got the project in 2015. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it's, that's how long city projects can take to get the necessary approvals and, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, the first thing they did is they kicked off uh, the project with a green charrette and they involved they had the project team, representative neighborhood groups, the city, uh, housing, um, housing and community development uh, office. Um, and in the green charrette, came, they, people had the idea of doing a zero carbon design as a major goal. And, and so the all electric design approach was introduced at the green charrette and the whole neighborhood um, uh, discussed and adopted it wholeheartedly. Um, so uh, then the design and permitting for the project uh, took three years and uh, construction finally began in, in 2019. Um, so it's a recently completed project. Um, involves uh, three different sizes of apartments, all the social services, community service in the neighborhood. You'll get a look at it in just a second. Uh, here's the site in the middle of the mission. Um, and um, you can see there's a, um, a little park on the south side of the site. Um, and uh, here's a site before there was any building. On the left in 2016, uh, you can see it was actually a parking lot uh, being used by the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. They were required to turn over the parking lot uh, to, to HCD for this uh, uh, major project. And the, the project program consists of uh, a, a new neighborhood park. Everybody wanted a park in the middle of the Mission District. And you can see it on the right there. It was completed before the housing was, was uh, started construction. Um, the park was uh, completed in 2017. Um, and uh, then the housing took place and was construction. You can see in the lower right image that's starting construction. Um, uh, I guess that was in 2018. And now I wanted this project did an embodied carbon assessment. I think it's worth um, 
spending a minute or two, even though I'm running short, I'm running short of time now, but I will just cover this uh, a, a bit. Um, it's covered uh, in a one page summary and a better summary than I'm gonna give it right here in the uh, uh, book, in, the, in, the, in this case study written in the book. Uh, more detail about uh, the the uh, embodied carbon assessment. So, um, because of the site, which was in a uh, what historically was a marshy area, uh, they built the mission out um, in a very very poor air, uh, soil um, for foundations, and they had to put a lot of concrete foundations into this uh, near high rise building. Um, so it's going to have a lot of concrete, and those who know now probably. Uh, that is going to be the biggest content for embodied carbon. Um, so they're going to have a lot of carbon in the project. So they decided to look at every nook and cranny of the rest of the project and try to minimize the embodied carbon uh, So because they didn't want a high embodied carbon in, for the project. Um, they used the uh, life cycle analysis, LCA uh, method, and uh, it's embedded in Revit now. Uh, in, it's called a tally suburb program. You can do all kinds of detailed analysis that I'll discuss with the next slide. <clears throat> and so they um, managed to um, uh, specify materials um, that minimize embodied carbon for the project. That was the goal and they succeeded in doing that. Uh, I just want to call your attention to, um, just like you're familiar with the, word, the term EY, energy use intensity as a measure of the energy use of a building. There's something called GWP or global warming potential, which is the um, measure of the amount of carbon uh, of a project. And um, this is the, uh, it's a metric system unit. Um, so we're still following the Europeans on this. Um, it's, um, the unit is uh, kilograms of CO2 per square meter of building. And the EQ means equal because some products are, don't, and it's not just CO2 that, they, they use to make the product, but methane and other uh, worse um, global warming gases. Uh, and so it's a CO2 equivalent, um, like methane is almost 20 times worse than CO2. So multiply the number by 20 uh, to get the uh, DWP. Anyway, that's all done in, in tally for you. Uh, and uh, oops, sorry, sorry. Click on the trigger there. Um, so this just shows a summary of, of uh, Methune's analysis uh, of the embodied carbon of the building. Um, and, you, and the upper chart shows it by specification division. That's why I called a division. And CO3 is concrete. And that's a huge uh, content of uh, embodied carbon for the building. Uh, it's, it, Tully also breaks it down by uh, parts of the building. Um, the ceilings, uh, mullions, uh, stairs and railings, and that kind of thing. And so you see the embodied carbon uh, as a function of the, type of the product, of type of the um, uh, component of the building. And the, the number for the building was just under 400 GWP. Um, and the bottom gray curve shows the average uh, for projects designed by Methuen uh, the past few years. Um, uh, that use, utilize structural concrete in the same way. Um, so they, they managed to pick the type of concrete mix and other features that, that what they call um, hot items or hot uh, products. If they find one particular product that has a high body carbon content, they replace it with another project uh, with less carbon body carbon. And in that way, they whittle away at the total body carbon. And uh, you can see that Previous project averaged out to about 500 DWP, and uh, they managed to knock um, knock it down by 20 percent uh, by by paying particular attention to the tally results. So I want to encourage uh, you to read about this in the book, in the case study in the book, and uh, do your research uh, from there. But there's a lot to be learned this way. Uh, and just to wrap it up uh, in the next five minutes or so, um, the, uh, the, the ground, uh, bottom two floors of the project, there's no parking. So they didn't have to do any, any excavation or, and use more concrete. Um, they uh, did away with that zoning requirement. Uh, 
and nobody has cars really. They take uh, transit, public transit. Uh, but anyway, the bottom two levels are community type spaces, either community organizations or things that the, like a cafe uh, that, the, uh, that the public would like to hang out in. Um, here is a uh, section through the building which shows you basically the lower two levels of communal spaces and the, all the apartments above. Um, uh, and then coasting through the uh, different components of the building, um, <clears throat> they, um, again, they, for first cost reasons, they use standard double glazed metal frame windows uh, and uh, no special air tightness measures were, were taken. Uh, and, but the one thing they did is they used metal studs would be, would be conventional for a building, a nine story building. Uh, they notice how they, and this, I put on one detail that shows rigid insulation uh, covering the metal stud framing, and that stops the thermal bridging. That's kind of a minimal thing to do uh, to, to, for good energy efficiency. Uh, the roof is uh, um, uses uh, insulating cellular concrete construction, so it gets good R30. Um, and uh, I'll refer you to the write-up uh, rather than my walking you through how this works, but they, uh, I am inserted a comment here, there's no heat pump in each apartment. They just use a heat recovery ventilator. The climate is good enough, sorry. The climate is good enough that you can heat and cool the space by use, you, through just having an individual HRV uh, for the apartment. You can read about the reasons why this, why they made this decision and how it's working and so on. Um, uh, my apologies. Um, so the, the net result of uh, that's good is there's no central system and the big thing is in, there's no ductwork that has to go through many floors and so on and so forth. So a lot of money was saved by doing this kind of system. And to do it, you had to have a good energy efficient system, uh, had to have shading on the glasses so you didn't need special cooling and so on and so forth. So this was an idea that energy efficient design uh, led for a much cheaper uh, first cost. Uh, so read more about it in the uh, write-up. Um, the uh, heating system uh, for the rest of the floors, the bottom two floors is a conventional uh, heat pump, uh, air ducted and so on. Um, and the domestic hot water is, uh, didn't have to have solar thermal, as I mentioned in the first uh, case study. So they just have a uh, central um, heat pump located on the roof. Um, and this is the solar PV, what it looks like. It's a, it's a small amount, but uh, it's surprisingly effective for a north nine story building, the roof of a nine story building and that, that limited and other things on the roof, mechanical equipment and what's left over is the solar PV, and they still got like 25% of the energy uh, use provided by the solar. So that, that was quite good. Uh, and you can see it here. Um, th this is uh, the modeling um, was um, predicted th this number. Why there's no heating bump, uh, I don't know. Uh, but the um, actual energy use is uh, got the bump, but it's very close to what was modeled. So it's quite a good number. Um, and here's the, as I said, the, the solar production is about 25% of the measured energy use. Uh, in, in this case, I'm showing the apartments only of the energy use. Um, and, um, uh, but the small amount of roof area is, it's be expected that it would be uh, lower than that. Uh, by quite a amount, quite a bit. Um, so summaries, um, did they achieve their project goals? Well, like they did, the Valley Carbon Assessment was very successful, helped them keep it, keep that number down. Um, it turns out that the power is coming from San Francisco uh, public utility, Hetch Hetchy, which is 100% water. It's, it's um, uh, water power. It's not uh, burning any uh, carbon fuel. So therefore, this project is so totally zero carbon in operation. Um, and it has energy efficiency, as I said, it's got a low EUI, so it works very well. Um, now here is somebody mentioned they wanted the um, uh, 
to see the uh, website where you can download the case study books for free. You can also get a link, as I mentioned at the beginning, for the flipbook and read it online, turning the actual pages. Uh, and so that works. And um, uh, yeah, so any um, final questions before we sign off? It's four minutes to one. Yes, Edward, I have a couple questions um, here. Uh, Mark Ober Oberholzer uh, from KTGY, he asked, case studies one and two were better than the baseline, but neither were net zero, strictly speaking. Is that correct? Yes, they are not net zero projects. Uh, net, net zero energy, I assume the, uh, the guy's referring to. Uh, they're not net zero energy. Uh, it can't be the... The amount of solar produces um, does not equal the energy use. It's multifamily buildings, their density of uh, energy use. And uh, generally, the amount of solar that can be produced from the, the roof insulation or even the carport insulation is not enough to cover it. Um, not, net zero car not net zero carbon because there's embodied carbon in every project. So you never get net zero carbon. You get net zero, you get zero carbon operation, but that'll happen automatically when we when the uh, en energy from the utility is all renewable, uh, all decarbonized, and that'll happen at the latest 20, 2045. Thank you for that. Uh, there's one other question. Uh, has <clears throat> excuse me? Has post occupancy been done about the effectiveness of the HRV? Um, not to my knowledge, it might be at this point. I, the, we started writing about these case studies about, oh, I, I guess uh, about nine, 10 months ago. And so it could be that there's been more of an evaluation uh, since then. So uh, I, I have no doubt that it'll be written about or check the website of the architects, for example. Um, you can, uh, if you, you're thinking about using that, I would definitely uh, talk to one of the architects or engineers of the project. They're very, they're very happy to share information. All right, I think that is it for the questions. Uh, if no, no one else has any other questions, um, I just wanted to thank Edward Dean for his knowledge and expertise uh, and Dave Intner uh, of SoCal Edison for making these seminars possible. Um, as Dave said earlier in the program, we have two more events on October 24th. Uh, a single family all electric and net zero carbon design and November 14th uh, code breaker accessory dwelling units uh, ADUs um, again thank you for uh, your attendance here uh, you'll receive one CES learning unit and I will be sending out a certificate of completion of the course that'll be emailed to you uh, we look forward to seeing you on October 24th and uh, thank you very much have a fantastic day thanks Mark Thank you. Okay.